Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Anaka Estampi, a second year master's student at the Symbiosis School of International Studies. I'll be your host for the first session today on the theme, Evolution of Indian Strategic Thought, Political and Economic Dimensions. Allow me to introduce and invite the chair for the session, Ambassador P.S. Raghavan to the dais. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for this opportunity uh, given to me to attend this very important conference uh, aimed at uh, uh, exploring, identifying, and, and, and debating India's strategic culture. Uh, we are very grateful to the External Affairs Minister for a, a panoramic view of the landscape which provided us a, a philosophical underpinning and an analytical framework for discussing this. And, and the importance of scholarship and activism to, shall we say, discover our strategic culture, to internalize it ourselves, to develop it, and eventually to democratize it. Uh, the the uh, minister talked about uh, Tanham and his uh, conclusions about a lack of strategic thinking uh, in the Indian uh, discourse. But one of the things which he mentions, which the minister also mentioned, uh, is that we have very few writings with coherent, articulated beliefs and a clear set of what he called operating principles for uh, Indian strategy. Uh, the minister identified this as partly derived from our own, uh, from our being prisoners of Western constructs. Uh, and our own inadequate study of our geographical, historical, and cultural uh, the, the historical, uh, geographical, historical, and cultural determinants of our strategic thinking in the past. Uh, if you look at it, if you, if you look at the history that we have studied from our history books, all of us at school and early college, a lot of coverage has been done of the Mauryan period. There is uh, a, a lot of writing on the Gupta period. And then, before we come to the Delhi Sultanates, you have, again, to use an expression by the minister, uh, airbrushed history. There is a lot, there's about half a millennium, millennium of history that we've had in the Deccan, where Deccan kingdoms, that's the Cholas and the Chalukyas or, or, or others, have actually governed large swaths of territory in the south extending to the north. They have expanded their soft power and hard power from Arabia to Southeast Asia. The Cholas had an, had an army, had a, sorry, had a navy and, and understood how the projection of maritime power and maritime commerce uh, could be done. So all of this did involve strategic thinking which was unique to their own geography, to their own, the geopolitical perspectives, their geography governing their politics. We have not captured them in our thought processes. And I think that is what, as the minister said, we need to do that in our scholarships. We need to be less apologetic about the, the, the origins of, of our own strategic uh, culture. Uh, he mentioned, of course, the, the, the uh, Mahabharata as the distillation of our uh, 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 strategic concepts, but uh, Kautilya was also mentioned. But uh, you also have, uh, for example, in the, in, where we are in Maratha land, the uh, Agya Patra. So there, are, there is a lot of discovery that we have to do and put it into our construct so that uh, we are able to then propagate it as a strategic culture and draw on it ourselves in our policy making. And, and the origins of uh, the evolution, the, the political and economic dimensions in the present day derives from the evolution of, these, of this uh, history. Uh, 
the minister mentioned pluralism. Pluralism is, is not a Western attribute. It is India's history of diversity and uh, coexistence that brings it to us naturally. Uh, nationalism and globalism, which are not antithetical concepts for India. So uh, I think this, this, this is the, uh, the, the canvas that we hope that in our first session we will uh, explore. Uh, but I want to say also that if one looks at what Tanham said, uh, he summarized what are or what should be, uh, partly what should be and partly what are India's strategic uh, perspectives uh, or what should India be looking at and what is India looking at. He mentioned four points. One, prevent neighbors from uh, carrying out inimic inimical actions against India's interests. Number two, he said, deny Pakistan uh, from challenging Indian predominance in this region. Uh, number three, prepare for a two-front war and uh, change the power equation with China in order to deter it uh, from attacking us. Using uh, USSR in order to deter, deter Pakistan and China from impacting on Indian interests. And, and, and finally, he said that India would like dominance of the Indian Ocean and expand to become a world power. Now, if you look at it, what he said in 1992 and what we're doing today, if you if you change our circumstances to where we are today and our capacities today, uh, this is not a completely unreasonable uh, description of India's strategic perspectives. I think we need to develop on it and obviously make use of the fact that we are not what we were in 1992. And I hope this is what our uh, session today will uh, explore, this session would explore. Um, we have I think already a conference booklet which introduces the uh, speakers at this session. The lead speaker is uh, my senior colleague in the Foreign Service, uh, uh, Ambassador uh, Rajendra uh, Abhyankar, uh, Abhyankar uh, who has been India's uh, ambassador to the European Union, besides a number of other diplomatic positions. And post retirement, he has been a distinguished academic. Uh, he's the author of a uh, of eight books. Uh, he has been teaching in universities and institutions in India and uh, abroad. Uh, the discussant, uh, Dr. Kajari Kamal, uh, from Takshashila Institution, uh, she has done ex uh, uh, intensive work on Arthashastra and uh, in that con uh, the uh, Arthashastra as one of the mainsprings of India's strategic culture. Um, it, in fact, her PhD thesis as well. The uh, second discussant is Dr. Saurabh Mishra uh, from uh, Amity University. Uh, he has also worked on the Kautilya as an inspiration for India's strategic culture, but also comparing Kautilya with Sun Tzu uh, and a number of other Western and Eastern strategic thinkers. So I hope we will have uh, a, an enriching discussion here uh, on the subject. So may I call upon Ambassador Abhyankar to, as a lead speaker. I'm delighted to start off this first session <clears throat> in what promises to be a thought-provoking and instructive conference on a subject of immense relevance in today's world. The Honorable External Affairs Minister, Dr. Jay Shankar, has given us a number of ideas to think on and deliberate. I would not have expected anything less than the erudite and brilliant presentation that he has made. I propose to lay before you the manner in which India can benefit from our long tradition of strategic thinking so we can exploit the opportunities in this uncertain world, as Dr. Jay Shankar calls it, which, provi which are provided to us. 
Let me again also refer to George Stanham from the Rand Corporation, who in 1992 wrote that India was not rich in strategic thinking. Even more so, <clears throat> noting, I note that more, many Indian thinkers appear to endorse this view. More recently, I was, I too was inclined to take this view. When after our loss in the World Cup cricket, I read of Austra the Australian team's strategy sessions, matching their individual bowlers and their skills and techniques with our batters. But of course, Tanham's view is far from the evidence we have of the tradition of Indian strategic thought that goes far back into history. The concept of strategic culture draws directly from the concept of political culture, of a nation which determines its approach to peace and security. This linkage has been acknowledged in the writings of Thucydides on the Peloponnesian War, Sun Tzu, and Kautilya. We'll hear more about Kautilya from my, those who are going to speak after me. They had all linked strategy to the understanding of a society and its culture. In modern times, this linkage has been expressed as the answer to the question, why do nations behave as they do? Strategic culture has been defined by Shiv Shankar Menon, another colleague, thus, Strategic culture is an identifiable set of basic assumptions about the nature of international and military issues. This would involve both a central paradigm about the role of war in human affairs, the efficacy of force, the nature of the adversary and so on, and a grand strategy or secondary assumptions about the operational policy that flows from these assumptions. Many fundamentals of India's strategic culture and practice remain rooted in the ideas that have come from ancient and medieval times. India's strategic culture and hence its strategic thinking is a product of his its historical, cultural, geopolitical and socioeconomic compulsions and considerations. It is a homegrown construct over millennia as modified by our experience over the last two centuries. Ken Booth defines strategic culture as one that refers to a nation's traditions, values, attitudes, patterns of behavior, habits, symbols, achievements, and particular ways of adapting to the environment and solving problems with respect to the threat or the use of force. For instance, war and peace are continuous themes in India's strategic culture, not celebrating it, but accepting it if inevitable. The philosophical and mythological factors that form the foundation of India's strategic thinking in ancient and medieval times led to the first serious discourse in the Shanti Parva in the Mahabharata on the concept of the state and the role of the king. Kautilya's Arthashastra further elaborates the conduct, duties, and strategies of the king. The Mahabharata's Bhishma Parva, or even Ashoka's edicts, further elaborate on the nature of kingship and of the state. Chandragupta Maurya and his successor Ashoka, and to an extent the Maratha Confederacy, the Cholas and the Pandyas who went forth on conquest in Southeast Asia, are examples of sovereigns 
who translated their strategic thinking into action in guiding their conquests. With this rich, with this richness of strategic thinking over generations, the time has come to be maximally guided by our accumulated wisdom to ensure that India achieves its external and internal goals in the future. Is it too far? Since independence, there have been occasions when we have successfully used our strategic perception to improve India's position in the world. However, in the past, there have also been occasions when we have foregone opportunities to better our position due both to a powerless economic condition and a faulty reading of the options. Some examples, Prime Minister Jawaharlal Nehru, on the basis of his strategic understanding, gave the newly independent countries of Asia and Africa a viable option by starting the non-aligned movement, earning great kudos for himself and recognition for India. At its height, NAM had over 100 member nations. He did this leading a country with an impoverished economy and minimal military hardware. On the other hand, after the India-Pakistan War of 1971, <clears throat> When he, we held most of the trump cards at the Shimla conference, Prime Minister Indira Gandhi decided to keep the POWs and gave up the territory conquered in West Pakistan. It is not known whether the possibility of a settlement in return for the territory and the POWs was even tried. This is in marked contrast to the present government's decision to stop all talks with Pakistan till terrorism stops. The airstrikes in Pakistan on 28th, 28th September 2016 in retaliation for the attack on the military camp in Uri and on 29th, sorry, 26th February 2019 on Balakot on an alleged training camp. This brings me <coughs> To my main point, India has today acquired a heightened economic and political status in the world. We are in a position to use our political and economic assets to rise further in the world. India is expected to be the fastest growing nation in 2023 among the G20 grouping that attended the G20 summit in New Delhi this September. After a rapid economic growth of 7.2% in 2023 fiscal year, economic momentum has been strong. Politically, the G20 meeting in New Delhi not only brought the, brought the G20 concept to the country as a whole, but its political success has increased our influence in the world. This is the right time, in my view, to take a long-term strategic view of the issues that need both deep consideration on whether the decisions to be made should be populist or made taking a longer view. I'll highlight a few that seem to me more pressing. The farmers' agitation, which has been ongoing since 2020, that continues to affect agrarian states like Punjab, Bihar, Karnataka, and Maharashtra, has descended into civic disruption, like rail roco, or blockading the major highways, disrupting economic and civil life in these states. There needs to be an understanding reached with the farmers' groups so that a peaceful method of protest is agreed. 
there is also need to consider the whole gamut of issues like agriculture pricing, export policy for specific agricultural products like basmati rice, the issue of middlemen, the minimum support price, the public distribution system, building of an adequate number of silos, and a various and a range of issues that still need to be addressed. The second is the prolific nature of freebies being offered in all states facing an election. Some of them coming up are in Mizoram, Chhattisgarh, Madhya Pradesh, Rajasthan, and Telangana, which will only swell the expenditure on subsidies of the state government, which will take office. Since the cost of all these freebies will be borne by the state sex sector, it would possibly imply an eventual recourse to handouts from the central government. Its cascading effect could be increased taxation. The central government needs to take a view on putting a state level cap on such freebie expenditure during an election and mandate the state government to find the funds from its own revenue. This addresses actually the issue of income equalities all across the country. Even though the country is economically doing well, with a projected growth rate of over 7%, the distribution of income and wealth remains highly skewed. There is no doubt that the entire Indian population expects their standard of living to keep improving. Yet giving freebies at election times, in some cases even promising cash transfers, are at best a very short-term answer. Possibly the Niti Aayog needs to study in depth this issue of continuing in income inequality in an overall situation of a booming economy and come up with some kind of a long-term plan. The special reservation given to women in parliament is of course laudable. Yet the clamor for reservation by other groups continues. For example, here in Maharashtra, where, the Mara which, where it is demanded by the Marathas. No decision can be taken on this without the involvement of the central government. Since it would affect members of the same community, Kundi, in other states as well. The question of an immutable long-term cap on total re reservation percentages at state level needs to be enforced. The perils of climate change are already being visited on a number of states during the monsoon season and after. In 2023, India ranked eighth out of 59 countries on, the climate, on climate performance, according to the Climate Change Performance Index, rising two spots from the previous year. We will have to take a long-term strategic view on both mitigation and adaptation to secure the committed funding for the Climate Fund at COP28, or the Committee of Parties, as it's called, to be held in Dubai from the 30th of November, that's in a couple of days. There is an imperative need. The next is there is an imperative need to take a long-term view on a population policy for the country, failing which the tremendous economic gains we are experiencing will be dissipated. It's more like being on a treadmill where you're running to stand still. The last attempt to do this was during Prime Minister Atal Bihari Vajpayee's tenure. A complete population policy was drawn up. During the cabinet discussion on approving it for introducing it in the parliament, his coalition partners 
expressed doubts, claiming that they could lose their seats. In this context, they referred to Indira Gandhi's policy during the emergency. That was the end of the discussion. Prime Minister Narendra Modi has an overwhelming majority in parliament, and it should be well within the government's capability to achieve this goal. Even Prime Minister, Shastri, Prime Minister Shastri's minimalist goal of hum do, hamare do, would be a good start. For India, which is moving from a civilization state to a nation state, it is imperative that it takes in hand issues that will improve its delivery capacity and enhance the quality of our long established democracy. The issues that I have highlighted were mentioned for this reason. There are, I'm sure, other issues that will equally require to be evaluated strategically to come to a long-term view on the best possible options. For example, the choice between increased defense spending and increased expenditure on human needs. In closing, I would say that the success of Indian democracy ever since independence has been rarely seen in any other case in the world. No Indian would like to change a system that allows us to freely choose our elected representative. If we can improve the delivery of this, of this system, it's, it will be all to the good. Possibly, the COVID committee's examination of the proposal on electoral reform will provide a viable plan. In raising, I hope, some of these issues that need long-term strategic thinking, I have set the ball rolling to provoke speakers who will follow me. One final word I will say to the 2023 batch of the Foreign Service. I, I joined the Foreign Service over half a century ago. I would just tell you that I enjoyed my career and I wish you the same. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, sir. <clears throat> For me, uh, the two, uh, two aspects of what you said greatly interested me. Uh, one is that you identified a number of st strategic decisions that had been taken post-independence. Uh, and uh, as our minister also pointed out, there is need for an honest post-facto appraisal of, of decisions taken, how they could have been taken better, and how we can incorporate better practices into our strategic uh, uh, thinking. Uh, the other, at the end, uh, you mentioned a number of objectives. Essentially, strategic objectives in different sectors in order to fit into our larger national goals and objectives. I think uh, that's a very important aspect of what will emerge as a national security strategy, which I believe the government is working on, where the, the trade-offs between various objectives will be fitted in so that uh, we have a more recognizable national security strategy to deal with people like Tanam. Uh, could I uh, invite our uh, discussant, uh, Dr. Kajari Kamal, to, uh, to speak? Uh, I wanted to point, it out, point out also that we are a bit uh, 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 lagging behind in time. So uh, I would request each of the discussants to speak for 10 minutes. And then we have a 10-minute Q&A from the audience uh, to, to aim to finish by 1.30. Thank you. Um, 
the time limit allotted to me, which has just been reduced from 15 to 10 minutes, doesn't afford me the luxury to address everyone, all eminent personalities in the audience, so I'll restrict myself to those on the stage. Uh, respected Chair, Ambassador Raghavan, Ambassador Abhyankar, my co-discussant, Dr. Mishra, and members of the audience, a very good afternoon. At the outset, um, I think it's extremely heartening to see the discussion on Indian strategic thought move from the realm of skepticism to a more productive discussion on its evolution and its potential influence on contemporary India's foreign policy making. So while we may have crossed the first hurdle, I think we are stuck at the second, which essentially is trying to figure out what is this body of thought? Does it speak in one voice or are there divergent views? What are the main political strategic strands and what is the relative importance of each one of those strands in terms of furnishing lessons for contemporary statecraft? How has this body of strategic thought evolved in a historically dynamic and geographically diverse environment? I hope to answer some of those questions in the next nine minutes. Um, this may not be perfectly viewable to all, and it kind of, uh, you know, helps me. Um, so what I've tried to do here is, in order to trace the evolution of India's strategic thought, I've plotted some, what to my mind are milestones in the intellectual discourse, from the ancient to the modern. And this by no means is exhaustive. Uh, in fact, rather admittedly, it's a hop, skip, jump. Uh, the two most eminent exclusions that come to my mind are the Islamic Persian strategic thought, which potentially got hybridized with indigenous uh, classical statecraft and the British influences. Limited by both time and my research area and encouraged by the watershed moment that this treatise has come to represent, I'm going to focus my discussion on the Arthashastra. The Arthashastra is a classic Indian theoretical treatise on statecraft the compositional history of which can be traced back to the Mauryan period. Now, why the Arthashastra? 2,300 years ago, there was this cohesive geocultural space with the desire to establish a pan-Indian empire encompassing it for the very first time. And it is in this political cultural context that the treatise, the Arthashastra was written, as a foundational text on international relations and political science. Second, very importantly, the text represents itself as a quote unquote compilation. So it's a compilation of the previous wisdom, Shastra, and practice, which is Prayog. So it kind of distills the wisdom from the earlier texts, antecedent texts, and has evident and substantive influence on the text to follow, right up to Sir Madhav Rao's hints on the art and science of government. But third and most importantly, and which is also pertinent to the scope of inquiry for today's discussion, is that Cotillier was a masterly exponent of the discipline of political economics, right? Uh, so it was with the Arthashastra that a good dose of uh, you know, strategic wisdom and argument and reason was injected into the political discourse existing then, which essentially looked at kingship in the context of morality and duty. Now, what is the discipline of political economics and how does it work in Kotlin's scheme of things? Okay, um, so if we go by the definition with Kotlin, himself provides of the term artha in Arthashastra. He calls it the land, the earth inhabited by human beings. The ruler who's called the Swami in the text is enjoined by Rajadharm and uses the science of politics, which is Arthashastra, to acquire, protect, augment, consolidate land. And this land in turn provides livelihood to the people. Uh, 2,300 years ago, 
All gainful economic production had to necessarily emanate from land, agriculture, cattle rearing, forest produce, mining. So when the people were physiologically, their needs were met, they were materially happy, they lent legitimacy to the ruler, paid taxes which helped maintain the Kotlian state. Because of that, the treasury or kosh was copious, and because of the affluence of the treasury, the army was well honed. And because of the strong army, the ruler's rod was strengthened, both in the domestic sphere, which helped him curb the political anthropology of the text is that of Matsunyai, and also wield the rod more effectively in the interstate realm. Now, as a consequence of this loop of activities, the Kotlin state helped achieve what it calls the political end goal, yoga kshema, which essentially is a combination of security, which is raksha, and palan, which is welfare. Now, what is this yoga kshema really, and how does it really manifest itself in the real world? And let's take the example of the Indian subcontinent. So, 2,300 years ago, it was the Indian political subcontinent, which was the quintessential Chakravarti Shetra that Kautilya calls, which is region of the sovereign, extending south of the Himalayas, north of the seas, and about a thousand yojanas west to east. This was the hub of civilizational growth, the nucleus of cultural congruence, the center of, for interregional trade. And very importantly, it was the most geographically defensible area Indian history has ever witnessed. And it is in this context that the modern empire was established and it flourished. Cut to the contemporary times, and we see this Indian political subcontinent having several political entities with concretized concepts of state sovereignty with political divides. Right? What compounds this problem is the preponderant presence of India in the region. So all the periphery, the states in the periphery of India see themselves as the weaker nations. And there is, if I can call the Thucydides trap, which uh, essentially um, you know, makes them prone to hedging, which in turn opens up avenues for extra regional powers to come in. But the eternal, the, the dictum, the idea that this region has prospered the most when it has been economically and culturally integrated remains eternally valid. And in today's day and time, which is marked by globalization, economic interdependencies, shared prosperity, I don't think India can achieve its yoga kshema, which is of security and welfare, unless it intertwines it with those of the other states in the subcontinent. So Kautilya would advise India to consider this first concentric circle of the Raju Mandala, which would otherwise be seen as the Ari Mandala, as the Mitra Mandala. And this is an adaptive understanding of the Raju Mandala dynamics in contemporary times. Uh, having said that, there is a nuanced difference in approach that India can have vis-a-vis -vis some of these countries based on the attitudes that they exhibit towards India. And I can go into it uh, in more detail if there's a question on that. But the overall policy proposal that Kotlia would have for India is neighborhood first, is about having a broad-based nonpartisan approach to each of these neighbors in the periphery to boost hard and soft connectivity, to economically integrate uh, this region to have a more balanced trade and to uh, borrow Professor Rajamohan's term, engage in positive unilateralism. Now, as the Raj Rajamandala radiates outwards, let me take up three of the most concerning foreign policy challenges for India in a Cotillion framework, and I begin with the United States. Okay. Um, from estranged democracies to natural allies, I think both India and the United States have gravitated towards each other at the turn of the century. Uh, just by the geography of the United States, its sheer size and its potential intention, it can be classified as a quintessential Udasina. Now, who's an Udasina? It's called the neutral king. 
which sits somewhere outside the spheres of the enemy conqueror and the middle king. In this case, hypothetically, if the enemy is Pakistan, middle king is China, then conqueror is India. And has the intention to keep them united or disunited as its own political interest may dictate. Now, what India has tried to do with the United States, and thanks to Kautilya's conception of comprehensive national power and the novel inclusion of an external ally as part of state power, it's the last seventh prakriti in the, uh, in the Saptanga theory. India has tried to make the United States its external ally. Why? We needed a affordable energy supply. I think the Indo-US civilian nuclear deal was extremely advantageous to India. We, of course, needed the United States to balance the rise of China. And for Kautilya, there are three things that you should look for when you're looking for an external ally. One, of course, is strength. That's the reason you're partnering. The other is convergence of interest. An ally in allies difficulty, trouble produces firmness in friendship. And stemming from convergence of interest, there is potential reliability uh, with a question mark, right? Now, why is this a tricky proposition to have the Udasina as a Mitra? Because Kautilya thinks that if you partner with a stronger power, then you are vulnerable to be dictated to by the stronger power. So while Kautilya would prescribe a somewhere which is called a strategic partnership in the text with the United States, it would also, he would also advance the caution that when a stronger partners with the weaker, the weaker ends up invariably ceding control to the stronger. And therefore you need to then work your relationship with the United States within the paradigm of the rubric of non-alignment, strategic autonomy. You need to optimize the benefits from the relationship without diluting strategic autonomy. Why would the US reciprocate? Because there is strategic convergence of interest. And that's why perhaps the US would be willing to allow India to still have an entente and really not uh, you know, get into an alliance. Now moving to China. Uh, this is slightly more complex and I have three timelines here and this is essentially because the relative strength, the correlation of forces between India and China keeps shifting. So we start with the 1990s, where India and China were roughly co-equal powers, right? They both decided to embark themselves on the path of economic reforms and wanted peace at the border, and therefore ended up signing what Kautilya would call a samdhi, which is essentially a negotiated agreement, a peace pact, a pact of non-aggression, which was in the form of the Border Peace Tranquility Agreements of 93, 96. It helped both countries consolidate themselves for almost two decades thereafter, but China consolidated better than India did. So there was an asymmetrical rise that China saw in about the first decade of the, of the century, and because of its territorial proximity with India, and because of its capability to keep both India and Pakistan united and disunited, as and when its political interests demanded, it becomes the quintessential Madhyam or middle king of this Rajamandla. And what is the policy prescription that Kautilya gives to this, uh, to deal with the Madhyam? I would think it's the way power, which is essentially dual policy, which is what India has tried to do with China for a very, very long time, which is manage its convergences and divergences, which is maintain peace at the border without ceding ground, economically engage, it's been mutually beneficial, to engage with China at multilateral fora, and of course, very importantly, to also simultaneously militarily prepare itself. Now what happened uh, in the run up to 2020, and in the summer of 2020 at the LAC in Ladakh, is what Kautilya would call a policy switch. And the policy switch was made by China. So China moved from Samdhi, which is a pact of non-aggression, to Yana, which is akin to coercive diplomacy. So it's called Samdhi Ya Yana, right? And why would China do that? China would do that because Kautilya would reason it out uh, based on two points. One, that it enjoyed a substantial strategic advantage vis-a-vis -vis India. And two, because the weaker power in the Samdhi 
was fervently trying to catch up, close the gap. So China has no reason to remain committed to the pact of non-aggression uh, uh, and essentially then became what Cotillier would call a contingent enemy, an enemy for the time being acting with hostility. And what is the prescription for India to deal with this Ari? Cotillier would think that India should use the space between foolhardy valor and spineless submission creatively and imaginatively. So it's a flexible response predicated on prudence, mantra shakti, right? Um, so I would think reconciliation, domestic capacity building, including through strategic partnerships, and of course, military buildup would be part of this multi-pronged comprehensive approach to deal with an Ari in China. Now, this is fairly simple to explain, but it's a very complex problem. India and Pakistan. From 1947 onwards, India is, as uh, the minister himself alluded to, a unifocal enemy. And Cotillia has a unique categorization of such enemies, for such enemies. He calls them innate enemies. They're enemy by birth, they're devoid of exemplary qualities themselves, and they're constantly doing harm. So in essence, they're irrational actors. And they also can be enemy in front and league with enemy in the rear in the context of nexus between China and Pakistan. And what would be Kotila's prescription to India to deal with such an enemy? I think he would propose the Opaya clusters, which is the methods of politics, Sam, Dan, Bhed, Dand. And I think India has tried to manage its relationship with Pakistan along these four pivots. Sam, I think the Lahore bus service, Agra summit, hands of friendship speech, there are many examples that one can quote here as overtures on the part of India to reconciliate. Dan, I would put the Indus Water Treaty, bilateral trade there, Bhed, and dissension, whenever we needed to do this, we resorted to it. But importantly, the Upaya clusters, as Kotlia explains it, can be used in this order of Sam, then Dan, then Bhed, and Dan to be resorted last. But he does say that an optimum use of this, these methods of politics can be either singular or alternate or a combination. So alternate is Sam Dan, then Bhed Dan, go back to Sam Dan, depending on the response it evokes from the adversary you're trying to address the problem with. For, for Pakistan, I think Kautilya would suggest a combination because success should be sought by a combination of the means. And that's all I have time for. <laughs> I'll be happy to take questions. Perfect timing. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, There's a very interesting uh, extrapolation of Cautillian precepts into the current situation and uh, fitting it into our strategic options today particularly how to deal with asymmetry, asymmetry with strategic partners, asymmetry with hostile partners. So uh, thank you very much for that. Uh, may I request Dr. Saurabh Mishra, please? 10 minutes, if you can, please. <laughs> uh, thank you, respected chair. Uh, respected uh, Honorable uh, Minister of Technical Affairs and the audience for giving me the opportunity to share my thoughts on uh, evolution of India's strategic culture. My task has been done uh, easier or means uh, uh, have been simplified by the explanation that uh, Dr. Kajari Kamal has made here by explaining how India's policy has evolved with the instruments of uh, and the tools of the Arthashastra. But when we have to trace the evolution of uh, India's strategic culture, we have to look into how India has evolved as a nation. The first thing, what India wants to defend, what India and how it conceptualizes itself. Of course, uh, Dr. Kajri Kamal referred to the Chakravarti Shetra, 
uh, the contemporary and the modern uh, bureaucrats and uh, scholars never imagine in those terms. But there is a intellectual concept of habitus that we are living in a environment and that we are subconsciously or unconsciously following those laws, those uh, values that uh, have evolved in our uh, culture and then thereby unconsciously and not knowing what we are doing actually are imagining on those uh, ground on, on those lines and then also for formulating our policies on those lines. So that concept of habitus comes in handy for us to understand how India's strategic, strategic culture has evolved. And therefore, uh, uh, Chakravati Shetra comes in evident here, uh, or very uh, relevant here. It means that this is the same geography which we have been uh, thinking of uniting for a very long time. Of course, before 1947, India was fragmented polities in the subcontinent that we uh, talk about these days. Uh, but still, what I would say that there was a unity. There was a, some kind of a consciousness of the fact that, as Dr. Kajri said, that is the geography that will be the safest and the most uh, desired for any of the empires uh, uh, to be built upon. And the key here is that there was unity and diversity identified already there at that point of time. And every ethnicity, which of course the Indian subcontinent is not just one ethnicity, 90% Han, China, no. India is very diverse and pluralistic in nature. So what India wants to defend here is, one, the space that it imagines of, as well as the cultural diversity and the conditions of cultural diversity that it has uh, to protect. And of course, uh, all strategy has been informed from these two important facts. We uh, became independent in 1947, but it doesn't mean that we had no culture, no civilization. Uh, we were not uh, popping up in a vacuum or space, uh, an empty space. So what, we, uh, what I'm going to just uh, briefly tell you that the long cultural uh, values and traditions that we, had have, we, we were having uh, have consistently kept informing consciously or unconsciously our decision making, our strategizing at conscious and, unsub and subconscious levels both. Starting from the very concept of uh, India. Mind you, one thing that culture is not a determinant, it's a shaper of uh, the strategic behavior. Same like uh, as we belong to Hindu culture or Indian culture or Muslim culture or many any culture, it may be giving or pre uh, prescribing certain value system uh, in its own text and representative text. But not everybody belonging to the community adheres to the same all the time. That's why uh, culture is not a determinant. It's a shaper of strategic behavior. It will keep a kind of constraint or pressure on you to behave in a certain way because that has evolved out of the realities of social, political, economic, geographical uh, uh, dimensions that we are living in. So given that, uh, what we are uh, is uh, the most important thing. And uh, uh, the compulsions of geography uh, was also important, which even compelled the British to think India or the subcontinent as a unity. They just uh, later on uh, uh, separated Burma from Indian administration. They realized there were some problems uh, uh, in keeping them uh, together uh, uh, as such. We must also remember that India has a culture, of course, but they are, there are subcultures. Same like uh, as uh, India is a nation, but there are sub-nations also uh, herein. The, the ethnicities who identify and they take pride in uh, being of a certain kind uh, or certain belonging to a certain community. So we, if we are trying to understand India's strategic culture, we also have to understand those subcultures and the mechanisms and the systemic uh, uh, processes that have evolved over a period of time, a meta-narrative 
or a hegemon narrative which actually we call as uh, the indian culture or the indian strategic culture and of course the representative text here is the arthashastra representative text i call because as dr kajri showed you uh, uh, from ancient times to modern times many of the uh, uh, texts in the lines that are uh, there and then centered and focused on kautilya arthashastra and that is not for no reason the reason is that wherever we go in india we find a manuscript or a, lit a literary work or a religious work or even work of dharmashastra which use the idea figures conceptual homologies which are academically given in the arthashastra epics are there at uh, ramayan mahabharat and even uh, uh, manusmriti when it goes into the details of the state craft actually they all use concepts from the arthashastra the history of arthashastra might be different but the ideas that are there in the arthashastra are important and has been incorporated or in fact i will say the science of state craft and politics in indian cultural space is the tradition of the arthashastra itself where the precepts of arthashastra is uh, embedded in so for that reason uh, 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 arthashastra becomes the most important text and shaping india's strategic thinking i was talking about subcultures and of course we should not forget about the maritime subculture that india was having in the uh, 12th 13th century uh, 13th century uh, uh, ad and therefore uh, uh, however it was lost uh, over a period of time but that subculture was a result of a imagination of a community the in the uh, south and the advancements in technological uh, uh, technological advancements which uh, actually uh, inspired uh, uh, those uh, rulers to go beyond uh, uh, the seas also uh, and uh, up to uh, indonesia malaysia and build the chola empire uh, that was kind of an aberration from the indian subcontinent that was happening at that point of time uh, and then it lost for a very long time and it has regained uh, it has come back uh, reverted back to us and that is the biggest evolution we are looking at uh, india strategic thinking and that is enabled by india's economic india's uh, uh, political and india's uh, technological advancement that it has achieved over a period of time and that is how it is actually impacting on india's strategic thinking in such a big way that it has uh, uh, the, the the subculture which used to be in uh, the 12th uh, 13th 13th century has been integrally incorporated with its uh, own continental uh, uh, or subcontinental strategic culture giving it a new dimension that is maritime dimension so that is the most important part uh, that we are looking at and uh, of course uh, uh, when we uh, talk about uh, uh, the strategizing uh, as such we should essentially look at uh, india's uh, disposition towards use of force dr kajri kamal also referred to the upayas and the shaktis which uh, allude toward the fact that india is uh, not preferring and doesn't have any predilection to you uh, predilection for use of force it doesn't want to be seen as uh, having a, a preference for, for uh, force as such however i must refer to the text of the arthashastra itself which talks about other subcultures existing even in its time even in its time that were giving preference to use of force but kautilya denounces them for it and giving reasons why he denounces that and then saying that uh, force is the last resort uh, uh, to be undertaken while strategy making so what repercussion it has on india's strategic thinking the clear idea here is india doesn't want to be seen as see to be so to be seen as some power which is arrogant one and we can take inspiration from the leadership of uh, lord ram as well he is amicable he is friendly he is uh, maryada purushottam but he has actually strengthened himself to so much level he's so powerful that power is used in such a way that it changes if that is history 
all the time. Uh, the, 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 the state of affairs in, in Sri Lanka. And against an asymmetrical power. Of course, uh, uh, Ravan was a, a very powerful uh, king as compared to this uh, uh, conglomerate uh, that uh, Rama, had, Rama has uh, forged to defeat uh, Ravana. So that way, uh, 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 India wants to be seen as a power which has uh, uh, a different disposition as compared to the countries that we know as the uh, United States of America or uh, even China uh, at the moment. So uh, from that, uh, uh, in, the, that, in that background, I can uh, uh, actually uh, refer to a couple of uh, uh, attributes that uh, India's strategic uh, thinking and uh, strategizing uh, uh, can uh, means uh, has, and we have uh, identified and called out uh, that those uh, 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 trends uh, uh, over a period of time. And the first one is humanitarian aspects of war. India has, India has a very different view of use of uh, uh, force. Uh, it never denounces the use of force. It accepts force as reality of life. And it accepts force as uh, uh, the actual uh, navigator of uh, survival and emancipation and even uh, implementation of uh, foreign policy because Arthashastra itself says that uh, Arthashastra is synonymous to Dandaniti, or uh, which as specifically is uh, administrating, administrating uh, uh, rod or uh, use of uh, coercive power. So Arthashastra, uh, so, so India's, uh, one of the important trends in Indian strategic making is the humanitarian aspects of war. And uh, the other is uh, power as reality which is not to be denounced and which has to be undertaken uh, uh, as to be integral to life. And also uh, uh, this uh, approach, we can look at uh, when India strategizes uh, in terms of its uh, nuclear policy and uh, also uh, specifically in nuclear doctrine. It's a big, big cultural uh, uh, trait, not just of India, but when we talk of Eastern uh, uh, philosophies, we see that uh, China also come in the same category. Uh, when we, uh, we can actually compare uh, uh, these aspects, how uh, the strategic thinking uh, of India and China has actually led to uh, the no fast use uh, uh, principle, which is not necessarily to be adhered with, uh, but uh, for some reason, uh, this is possible. Another example we can take as uh, India's uh, war uh, in 1971. And when we look at the continuities and changes, uh, uh, we can just refer to that uh, India has a great philosophical continuity when it comes to uh, culling out the principle of strategic thinking. In the philosophical domain, it is there. But in uh, the uh, uh, operational uh, domain, things have kept changing with the advancement in technology. And of course, uh, it gives new dimensions to uh, strategy making. And we should never confuse these new dimensions of strategy making as uh, the values of the cultural, uh, uh, or you can say, cultural principles. Uh, cultural principles apply in different, different, different uh, technological contexts uh, uh, um, differently, but they remain as uh, they are. They are the continuity uh, there. And of course, when we look at other trends over a period of time, strategic autonomy is important, and then strategic ambiguity, which emerges out of India's uh, idea of uh, or understanding of uh, reality uh, of uh, life and uh, interstate uh, affairs. So uh, what are the changes? Of course, India has become, become more vocal. India has become more uh, assertive. And this is uh, because of the strength it has uh, acquired uh, uh, in the contemporary times, which is, of course, uh, not against uh, strategic uh, culture as such. It is no, it is in, there is no contradiction uh, between India's uh, 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 prescriptions or uh, India's uh, practice, uh, what it does. However, we can talk about that in the question and answer session. Uh, what are uh, the details of uh, these aspects? Uh, and finally, India culture has been to appear aggressive only when it is needed or imposed on it. And India adheres to it. 
the question only was when to uh, uh, start uh, uh, our uh, uh, assertion and uh, taking uh, taking uh, uh, our uh, viewpoints forward uh, to the world and of course thereby debunking the politics of knowledge that we have faced and seen across uh, since colonial times. Uh, so that was all uh, uh, from my perspective uh, on uh, uh, the uh, uh, India's uh, evolution, evolution of India's strategic culture and there may be uh, discussions uh, with the questions asked. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, two points you made. One was about subcultures, the, the way in which different parts of India have looked at their strategic thinking. And you pointed out very relevantly, you know, peninsular India had a, had a maritime outlook because of its geopolit geopolitics, its geography and culture. Whereas Northern India had a continental outlook. Uh, and, and I think what we're doing today is trying to integrate the two into our strategic culture. Uh, and very important, the, the fact that an understanding of this has given us the self-confidence to assert our strategic perspectives to the world, to own it and to assert it. I think that's, it's, uh, these are important points. Um, uh, as we said, we are running very short of time. We are well past our scheduled uh, program. So uh, I've been asked to limit the Q&A to just two questions from the audience. So I invite uh, questions and if there are comments, please keep them very short. Uh, the, the floor is open. I hope there are there is somebody who will provide a mic to uh, those who wish to ask a question. I can see a hand there and if I can so as not to uh, to give equal chance to right and left, if I can find a hand somewhere here, it would be nice. Okay, anyway, why don't we start with the hand there, which I saw. Uh, thank you. In the, in the entire evolution of Indian strategic thought, including the Honorable uh, External Affairs Minister mentioned that we have a presentation that we wish to put forth as Bharat, right? Now, with all the other countries that were cited... Sorry, uh, say, say again, as so what? There is one projection of an image of a country, right? We, we need to get the narrative of India out. In that sense, the other countries that were cited were largely homogenous. Out here, there is a variety, and I'd like to also see, uh, invite comment on whether there's any mention of tackling this in the in the Arthashastra, because in the Mauryan culture, there was largely, a, a, it's again, homogenous out there as well. Whereas India as it stands today, there is no one Indian culture. There, are, there is a claim, and that's of the various reasons that the EAM pointed out. One of the things that is, apart from modernization, etc., is the internal conflict in India as to what is Indian, right? In that sense, what is the, the approach for, or what is the strategy to tackle that? There is an internal debate uh, on what is India about organization of society, not uh, looking at uh, uh, organization, not with reference to the organization of the state as such. That is uh, uh, the peculiar uh, uh, thing that we must uh, notice here. Because uh, when we are talking about uh, 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 actually, uh, uh, what was the uh, question? Oh, yes, yes, yes. So that way, uh, uh, there is a consensus on the fact that subcontinent is a geocultural space, not a kind of, uh, you can say, uh, uh, political uh, uh, space first. So when India is a geocultural space, which has been imagined for thousands of years, for so long time, even where there is difference in terms of uh, different communities living in different parts of India, 
even if there has been uh, some kind of invasion happening uh, to the Indian subcontinent from outside and cultural interaction taking place uh, between uh, the Islamic culture and the uh, Hindu culture as such, there has been hybridization. And this hybridization has led to a kind of consensus in the subcontinent, uh, which actually imagines India as a political unity still. There may be differences about, again, sub-imaginations. There may be differences about uh, uh, organization of the societies, but not as organization of the state in a given particular geography and the fundamental principles which are actually the product of hybridization that has taken place over a period of time with interactions of two different cultures. We have seen that uh, even the statecraft principles in the Mughal era, even the, uh, in the uh, uh, Sultanate era, has been innovated, has been uh, hybridized just in order to actually keep India as, or imagine India as a political unity it, at the uh, uh, level of the subcontinent that is the Chakravarti Shetra since ancient times. So hybridization has taken place with idea of the geocultural unity in place. It has never violated that uh, uh, principle and imagination and consciousness uh, as such. That's why uh, uh, we are uh, one nation still. I'll add very briefly to that, and I'll use the term that I put up on the slide, but I didn't have the time to speak about, the concept of ancient palimpsest. Uh, Prime Minister Nehru himself, and he said that India is an ancient palimpsest, which is there are layers upon layers which have happened, and every successive layer has not erased the fundamental of the previous layer. So while there have been adaptations to the strategic context in different eras of invasions, I think the core has persevered. And just to give you an example, uh, so that, you know, it's, that the point strikes you, this idea of the materialist stance that I spoke about in the Arthashastra is also spoken about in the epics and is also spoken about in the 1881 text, which is Mother Rao's, uh, uh, you know, hints uh, to Sayaji uh, Rao Gaikwad. So the point I'm trying to make is, and if I could use Harry Eckstein's pattern maintaining change, I think uh, uh, you know that has existed. But I cannot say it with confidence because I mentioned to you upfront that there is the second hurdle that we do need to see what are the voices and do these voices uh, really have divergent or convergent views about what India's strategic culture can potentially be. Thank you very much. Good. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, uh, I, uh, the point that, by the way, that you made about India not being a single culture, it's something that E.A.M. addressed in his uh, speech as well. It's also in his uh, book that it is a diversity. The coexistence uh, in our diversity of culture is what has uh, promoted an Indian idea of pluralism. And that is something that I think we need to keep in mind. So uh, with just, this... Excuse me, sir. Just one second. In, right here, back. It's me. Ah, um, there are two know. points there. I'm not, I'm not even going into ah, the aspect that. of other cultures coming in. If you pick the one common thing that the EM as well as other sp uh, speakers spoke about as the Ramayana, there are 17 interpretations of the Ramayana, right? And there are many more. So there is no one thing that can go out as the Ramayana technique. We, we choose to pick the Valmiki one, right? Down south, they wouldn't pick the Valmiki one, right? Uh, there are varieties right there in one text. Now, this is not something that you would find with the Odyssey or the Iliad. There are no 15 Iliads. There's just one. But with the Ramayana, there are so many of these. Right there at Ramayana. Forget about the other cultures coming in. And then we're talking about all of these layers getting slapped on the sandwich of India. What is India then? Becomes a question, I think, which has to be repeatedly asked because when you choose to say this is the aspect of India that goes out to the other countries, there are enough voices saying, no, that's not the side of India that we subscribe to or is part of our culture. Which is what I was trying to highlight as to how does one make a choice? So, right at the Ramayana, you're all out. Even if you say that, okay, let's pick the Ramayana and stick to the Ramayana, you're out right there. There are 17 different texts there. No, that, that's all right. In fact, 
That is why we have a two-day conference with multiple sections <laughs> to explore the <laughs> idea of India. <laughs> so, so one, uh, one question. Uh, I, th so I think we've, excuse me, I think we've run out of time. You can shift the question to another session because so there are one quick overlapping question. sessions. So one quick question. Uh, I'm Professor Uganda and since uh, we are from the academic institute, so my question is, as per the new education policy, we all the universities, we have to come up with the Indian knowledge system. So what should be the framework of the Indian knowledge system and what should be the outcomes of it so the uh, students can get you know, used to this culture of from strategic point of view or any other point of view because uh, it's not getting properly framed, the Indian knowledge system in the education system. Uh, I would say that this is well beyond the framework of this particular session and my answer would be the same as to the other gentleman. We have two whole days to explore various aspects of uh, our strategic culture which, which need to be incorporated into the new education policy. May I bring this session to an end because we are well beyond time. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you to our panelists. Thank you. And thanks to the audience.